Welcome back. In this third set of slides related to the clustering of rates, we're going to focus on scan statistics. And scan statistics are a different perspective on what is a cluster. In the previous lecture dealing with the local Moran adjusted for rate variance instability, a cluster was there always a location with its neighbors. So you didn't really have clusters that consisted of a single location. In the scan statistics, that is a valid notion of a cluster. So in a scan statistic, you don't necessarily have to have the neighbors. You can find a cluster that is a single aerial unit, which is a little bit different. So what we're going to do is first I'll talk a little bit about the, the general perspective, the general concept of a scan statistic and then provide some technical detail on two uh, well-known cases, the BSAC Newell approach, and then arguably the most popular, most well-known approach is Kuldorf's scan statistic, which has its own specialized software in the SatScan software package. Um, okay, uh, what, what is a scan statistic? What is a scan, first of all? A scan is very simple. It's, it's some aerial shape, typically a circle, but it doesn't have to be a circle. It could be a square, it could be in an ellipse, it could be something based on networks. And uh, it's some shape, and you count the number of events within that shape. So let's say it's a circle with a given radius, and you count the number of events within that uh, radius. We've already seen this in different guises. In fact, uh, we saw the uniform kernel, which was a disk with a given radius, and we counted the number of events in that kernel. That is the same principle underlying what is known as the GAM, or Geographical Analysis Machine, which was a way suggested by Openshaw and co-workers to try to find clusters. Now, the problem with the Openshaw approach is that it didn't really have a way to assess significance. And both the scan statistics or the families of scan statistics that we'll discuss here do have a way of assessing significance. So in other words, with the Openshaw, Openshaw GAM approach, you had circles and with varying intensity, but you couldn't really have, you didn't really have a formal way to decide which one was significant and which one was not. And so how does a scan statistic work? It's like a bullseye. You focus it typically on the centroid of an aerial unit and you increase the radius of the circle and count how many events are happening within that shape, uh, within that radius of the circle. And, and you continue until you reach a stopping criterion and as we'll see, the two different approaches use a different stopping criterion. So the um, scan statistics um, count events. They increase the size of the shape until they reach a stopping point, uh, as I mentioned. And the stopping point is what is referred to as the most significant shape. Um, a typical approach, and the one that I will illustrate, uses the circle, a circle as the shape and the centroids. But as I mentioned, there are many generalizations of different shapes and different ways of um, addressing this increasing radius. So the two main approaches, one is ref uh, referred to as BSAC Newell, the other one as Kohldorf. The Kohldorf one is the better known one of the two they use a different criterion for the stopping point. So the BSAC Newell one increases the circle until a critical number of events is reached. The Kohldorf approach increases the circle until a critical num a population size is reached. So both use the same principle. They go through every spatial unit put the center and the centroid of that unit, look at the circle um, and increase the radius and, and basically uh, 
go from the first nearest neighbor to the two to, and so forth, keep increasing the radius until you reach a, a stopping point. And then at that stopping point, you carry out a statistical test. That's the general idea behind a scan statistic. So the BSEC Newell one, as I mentioned, uses the number of events as the cutoff point. And so um, you increase the circle and count the number of events until you reach a cutoff point. And then at that point, using the average, again, the reference for the whole area, the same idea we've seen now several times in the excess risk rate and in the empirical base smoothing, we take the reference risk and then find out the probability of finding the observed number of events given the reference risk as the parameter, typically with a, a Poisson distribution, turning the um, reference risk into an expected number of cases. What is the probability? We've seen this before in our probability map. It's always the same general idea. The reference is the Poisson distribution. So if we have um, many more observed cases than we would expect um, under the Poisson distribution given the expected number of cases using the reference risk, we can attach a probability value to that. And we do this, um, remember, we do this for every unit. So for every unit, we increase the circle and then stop at the reference point, the number of events that we want and then compute the p-value. And then we pick the one with the highest p-value. So the one, the cluster with the highest p-value consists of a center and then the neighbors in increasing radii of circle up until the critical number of events has been reached. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. We go from unit to unit we increase the circle and we reach the critical distance. Let me illustrate this um, for um, the Illinois case. And then I'll backtrack a second. So this is a, a DeKalb County. So we take the smallest circle and we find its neighbor Kane County. And then we count the number of events in both cases. Now, the problem with carrying this out is what do we take as the reference um, cutoff point? And we have to be careful here because, for example, in the Illinois uh, COVID cases illustration, we have counties with no cases, and then we have some counties in the Chicago metro area with more than 12,000 cases. The mean is 217, but the median is only 11, which illustrates how skewed the distribution is. And this median of 11 is really driven by a large number of counties with no cases whatsoever. So for just case of uh, reference, we take K as 1,000, and five counties in the Chicago metro area have more than 1,000 cases. Now, as it turns out, and that's why I use it as an example, DeKalb County does not have a, count, a thousand cases, but Kane County has more than a thousand. So how does this work? We start with DeKalb. We don't have our critical value of cases. We add the first nearest neighbor, Kane. This one has 1,299 cases and an associated population and, of course, an associated crude rate. We take the events together, the cases together, we reach our critical value, which was a thousand. So here we stop. So now we consider DeKalb and Kane as a potential cluster. We find the, uh, the rate. We compare this to the rate for the state as a whole. This relative risk or excess risk is 1.31. Um, we, um, compute using the state 
average rate, what the expected number of cases is. We have 1432. We expected 1095. So we have more than what we expected. What is the probability under a Poisson distribution of having 1400 cases when the mean is 1095? That probability is extremely small. So we stop, we say we have a p-value. Then we move to the next county and we repeat the process. We increase the rate. So the next county is Kane County, which could very well be a cluster in its own right because it meets the minimum threshold. So we uh, compute the p-value for Kane County and we repeat this process over and over. So as a result of this, we end up with multiple clusters and we can rank them by the p-value. So the most significant one first, then the second most significant. But one um, kind of um, outcome of this is that the same county can be part of multiple clusters. It can be part of a cluster by itself, is it's large enough. It can be part of a cluster as being a neighbor of say county A, but it can also be part of a cluster as a neighbor of county C, for example. So that's a little bit um, potentially confusing with this um, bisag newell approach. And so uh, the result for our COVID cases in Ohio, in Illinois, is the following map where um, I actually did not distinguish uh, between individual clusters because they overlap. So this is the result for the six most significant clusters and several counties. Uh, we have 10 counties and six clusters. Several counties belong to more than one cluster. So we see this kind of grouping of counties around the Chicago metro area and then across from St. Louis. St. Louis is here, is in a different state in Missouri. So that's what BSAG Newell does. Very simple principle. We center our circle on each county in turn. We increase the radius until we hit the critical number of events and we compute the p-value using the Poisson distribution. Then we rank all these clusters from lowest p-value to higher p-value and we you know, we could stop at one and pick the one with the smallest p-value but typically we look at a few of these and then we also typically observe that the same uh, that a given county can be part of multiple clusters so this becomes a little bit difficult to interpret um, the p-values we have the same problem with the local moran they're suspect because of multiple comparisons also these tests are sequential so the same county is involved in multiple tests the clusters overlap the same county can be part of different clusters so it's not always that easy to interpret the results of the BSEC Newell approach as I mentioned earlier the Kulldorff scan statistic is by far the better known of the two and it uses a different pr principle it's still you know, we'll focus a scan on each county in turn and increase the circle, but now it will aggregate the units until a target population is achieved. So not a target number of events, but a target number population at risk. And then it doesn't compute a p-value, but it computes a likelihood ratio. A likelihood ratio essentially comparing the odds in inside the cluster to the uh, odds outside of the cluster. So that's a little bit of a different uh, logic and also it depends on what the underlying probability model is. And so there are many different scan statistics using different underlying probability models. For example, the Poisson is probably the most straightforward one when we're dealing with events, but you can also use a Bernoulli distribution, that's a 0-1 distribution, if you have cases and controls, or when you have continuous variables, you can use a normal distribution. So there are several null models that can be used, but the principle is always the same one. You uh, 
create these candidate clusters starting with a spatial unit and adding neighbors as the radius increases until you reach a critical population size. At that point, you compute, given your underlying probability model, you compute the likelihood ratio. And then you pick the one with the highest likelihood ratio, the maximum likelihood ratio, and that is your cluster. And then you use a permutation approach, just like before, a simulation approach, to assess a pseudo p-value for that cluster. At that point, you can repeat the process. You take the cluster out of the observation set and repeat the process for a secondary cluster. So the scan statistic always end up with one primary cluster and then potential secondary clusters. And it avoids the problem of a county or a spatial unit being part of multiple clusters, which BSEC Newell has. The initial discussion is in terms of a circle and increasing the radius, but there are many different uh, extensions of there's a huge literature um, devoted to scan statistics, different shapes, as I mentioned, ellipses or custom shapes. It is can be extended to space-time cluster analysis. You know, in this course, we've we will limit ourselves to the cross-sectional case. And then, as I mentioned, there is a specialized set of software, SatScan software, uh, devoted to these all these many different special cases. The Poisson model is probably the most straightforward. So it bases the likelihood ratio on the number of events inside the window versus outside the window, again, using the expected number of events as the reference. So the expected number of events is always calculated in the same way. There is some reference rate, typically in for the case for the state as a whole or the country as a whole, then this reference rate is applied to the population of the spatial unit to get the expected number of cases. So this ratio power to the number of counts inside of the window and then its counterpart outside of the window, that is the likelihood ratio. So we move our center of the circle from county to county in the centroid. We increase it until we reach the critical population. We compute the likelihood ratio. So uh, if we have 85 counties, we have 85 likelihood ratios. We take the maximum one, that becomes the primary cluster. The Bernoulli model is a little bit, uh, the expression as you see it here, is a little bit more complex, but is basically the same thing. It compares what is inside the cluster with what is outside the cluster, but now it uses a differentiation between cases and controls, and actually the controls don't appear explicitly, but the total number of cases plus controls is, is what um, is taken into account, both inside the window and outside the window. And so you see all these different ratios with different powers. You just plug in the numbers. As it turns out, um, the Poisson approximation is actually pretty good uh, when there are not very many cases relative to the controls. So cases and controls would be with the disease versus without the disease. In our application, we um, will, in the lab, we'll do both, but we'll see that basically there isn't much difference between the two. So the likelihood ratio test, as I mentioned, we find a window with the max maximum likelihood, and then we base inference on randomization. We uh, use the reference constant risk and then simulate what the number of cases might be randomly under the null hypothesis of a constant risk and then we compute a pseudo p-value from that the way we've done over and over again in in previous cases so um, computation is straightforward as i mentioned two steps increase the window and teach until we reach the critical population size compute the likelihood ratio, 
and then find the one with the maximum likelihood ratio, which is the most likely cluster. And at that point, once we have the most likely cluster, we use the Monte Carlo simulation approach to get a pseudo p-value. Then, as I mentioned, once we have the most likely cluster, we can find a secondary cluster. And uh, one thing that you encounter a lot with SATSCAN, if you don't pick the population, the cutoff population carefully, is that many uh, spatial units can become a cluster by themselves. If it meets the minimum population threshold, then it can be a cluster by itself. So that is a very different notion of clustering compared to what we saw with the local Moran, where a cluster is always a location with neighbors surrounding it, not a location by itself. A spatial outlier can be a location by itself, but a cluster is not never a location by itself. By convention in SATSCAN, but that is just you know a rule of thumb, you take 10% of the total population as the cutoff, but that's definitely something that needs to be manipulated in a sensitivity analysis, because obviously, depending on the size of the populations in the individual spatial units, 10% uh, may or may not be a meaningful cutoff value. In our COVID example for June, the primary cluster is Kane County up here by itself. Um, we saw earlier that it met the number, the, the thousand cutoff for the number of events. It also meets the cutoff of 10% of the state population. So it includes 10% of the state population. It is a cluster by itself. Similarly, we have several other counties that are cluster, not this one here, this one, that are clusters uh, by themselves. So there's two clusters with two counties, the green one here, and then the red one here around Springfield. But all the other clusters, including the primary cluster, are counties by themselves. So this is a very different notion, as I mentioned, from what we saw with the local Moran. So this is the result of a um, SAT scan type analysis, a scan analysis. Uh, <clears throat> the interpretation, we have the same problem as before. We have multiple comparisons for the p-values, but the most useful interpretation is the most likely cluster. That is clearly the, the, um, the location for which the likelihood ratio is the highest. The secondary and, and other clusters are ranked in terms of their likelihood ratio, and it's not always clear where one would stop because the p-values, as always in these cases, are corrupted in a sense because of the multiple comparisons. So that's one of the drawbacks of using the scan statistic for more than one cluster. If you're only interested in identifying the primary cluster, it's just fine because at that point you're not doing multiple comparisons. Just to conclude, a comparison of the two, and as you see, these are very different impressions from clusters. You know, these, the BSAC Newell, first of all, <coughs> a, a county in our example can be part of multiple clusters which can be a little bit confusing, but it does identify regions um, around the larger metropolitan areas, whereas the scan statistic picks up uh, some rural locations as well. So it's a, a different measure of uh, scan statistic. Where does that leave us? Well, now we have uh, moved away from the points. We converted them into a spatially intensive variable, a rate or a proportion. We saw the problem with the rates, the variance instability, which affects our mapping. So we have a way of smoothing the rates to correct for that in simple visualization. Then we saw how that variance instability affected the computation of the local Moran, which can be used to find clusters of rates. But in the local Moran, the cluster is always an observation together with its neighbors, whereas in the scan statistics, 
Clusters can be observations by themselves. Scan statistics simply add events or populations in an increasing circle, stop with when a critical point is reached, either based on the number of events for BSAC Newell or based on the population for the Kuldorf scan statistic, then for BSAC Newell you compute a p-value, whereas for the Kuldorf scan statistic you compute a likelihood ratio and you pick the one with the highest likelihood. This concludes the three modules that deal with point patterns, which were primarily univariate analysis. Starting with the next module, we tackle multivariate analysis, where we have multiple variables to consider. See you then.